Hello, and welcome to the history of the early church. Episode 25, The Anti-Pope. Last episode, we looked at origin of Alexandria's contemporaries in the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Today, we head west this time and once again visit the Church of Rome, as it struggles through tumultuous debates over the person of Christ. A few things about this episode before we begin. When it comes to primary sources, the subject of this episode is one of the most difficult to reconstruct into a coherent narrative. Hence, you may hear me using a lot of caveats throughout this episode. The main figure of this episode will be Hippolytus of Rome. Even in antiquity, this man was an enigma, with various ancient authors providing contradictory details concerning when and where he lived. The traditional account, now found in modern scholarship, goes like this. Hippolytus was a presbyter who lived in Rome during the late 2nd and early 3rd centuries. He believed that the current Catholic bishops of Rome were guilty of heresy, and so separated himself and his followers from their communion. He thus set himself up as the true Orthodox bishop of Rome, and thereby became the first so-called anti-pope. Eventually, however, he reconciled his community with the rest of the Catholics when a persecution sent both him and his episcopal rival into exile, after which Hippolytus and his rival bishop died as martyrs and their reunited communities elected successor to both of them. I will be following, with a few minor tweaks, this conventional account, but I want you all to know that the whole Hippolytus question is still up for debate. We last left the Roman Church during the tenure of Bishop Victor. Victor, if you remember from episode 18, had launched the Quartodeciman controversy over the date of Easter, which prompted the intervention of Irenaeus, who urged Victor to pursue peace and tolerance within the Church. We also saw how Victor, due to his connections with the Emperor Commodus's supposedly Christian mistress, Marcia, managed to secure the release of Christian prisoners from the hellish mines of Sardinia. Among those who were released was a certain Callistus. More on him later. It was during the reign of Victor that the controversies over Christology began in the Roman Church. A cobbler from Byzantium named Theodotus came to Rome and began to teach a rather novel kind of Christology. Theodotus taught what is sometimes called dynamic monarchianism, but more commonly known as adoptionism. That is, Jesus was not the eternal divine Logos, but a mere man. At his baptism in the Jordan, when the Holy Spirit descended on him, the Father adopted him as his son and gave him the power to work miracles. Theodotus rejected the idea Jesus was divine, but some of his followers went on to teach that Jesus became divine after his baptism or resurrection. Theodotus' critics allege he had made up this Christology because during persecution he renounced Jesus, and so, by claiming Jesus was not divine, Theodotus could say he had not betrayed God, but a mere man. Theodotus was excommunicated by Victor, but two of his disciples continued his teaching. A banker, also called Theodotus, and another man named Asclepiodotus. They in turn tried to form their own community, and paid a man named Natalius to be their bishop. Natalius, however, quickly repented of his actions and returned to the Orthodox fold. The adoptionists were also not particularly interested in the scriptures, but often preferred to discern spiritual truths from Greek secular sciences. They were especially devoted to Galen, whom we discussed in episode 17. 
perhaps his critical attitude towards Christianity spurred them to change the faith and make it more palatable to classical Greek thought. The adoptionists would continue on as a small sect. Decades later, a mysterious man named Artemon was attempting to revive their teaching. These later adoptionists claimed that their teaching had been the historic teaching of the Roman Church, and it was only corrupted during the episcopacy of Victor's successor, Zephyrinus, who became Bishop of Rome in 198 AD. The second major heresy to ignite controversy in Rome, and by far the more influential and serious one, was modalism, also called monarchianism, or modalist monarchianism, or Sabellianism. We first encountered modalism back in episode 20, where we discussed how Tertullian wrote a refutation against an Asian modalist named Praxius. Modalism argued that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were not distinct persons in one Godhead, but simply the same divine person in different modes, hence the name modalism. The impetus for modalism was likely a reaction to the Logos Christology articulated by various Christian intellectuals, such as Justin Martyr. The divine transcendence of God the Father and his dealings among the material world were reconciled by using the Platonic idea of the One and the Demiurge. The Father was the One, the Supreme God, and the Logos, the Son of God, was the Demiurge who dealt with the lower material world. The problem with this was that it tended towards what is called subordinationism, and ultimately ditheism, belief in two gods. By treating the sun as a sort of subordinate, second-tier deity, the distinction between the father and the logos was so great that it bordered on polytheism and made the sun an inferior being, subordinate by nature to the father. The modalists rejected this and went to the other extreme by eliminating all differentiation between the three persons of the Trinity so as to maintain monotheism. This is why they are also called monarchianism, because they wished to uphold the monarchia, or unity and oneness, of God. Objections to modalism included the assertion that it did not accord with the presentation of God in Scripture and the apostolic preaching of Christ, where the Father and the Son are one God and yet distinguished and coexistent. The modalists were also labeled by their opponents as patripassionist, meaning the Father had endured the Passion. If the Father and His Word and Son were simply one person in different modes, and not distinct, then that meant that God the Father suffered and died on the cross. This, of course, fundamentally changed the entire nature of the Christian Gospel. The origin of modalism is traced back to one Noetus of Smyrna. Noetus was excommunicated for his teachings by the presbyters of the Church of Smyrna, but his followers brought his ideas to the city of Rome. The exact identity of who brought modalism to Rome is disputed. Our Roman sources point to a disciple of Noetus named Epigonis, while Tertullian of Carthage claimed it was Praxius. Perhaps those two are one and the same. We don't know. The important thing is modalism took root in Rome and caused no small controversy in the local church. Our principal sources, aside from Tertullian, for both adoptionism and modalism are three documents. The so-called Little Labyrinth, the Refutation of All Heresies, and the Contra Noetum against Noetus. The authorship of all three of these documents is difficult to discern. The most recent and up-to-date scholarship argues that the Contra Noetum was written by the famous Hippolytus mentioned earlier. The refutation, although traditionally ascribed to Hippolytus, was probably written by a predecessor of sorts to Hippolytus, coming from the same school in the Church of Rome. 
The Little Labyrinth is the most difficult to pin down of the three. It comes from some time later, combating the followers of Artemon. Sometimes the author is identified with a Roman presbyter named Gaius. Some sources allege Gaius was a member of a heretical sect called the Aelogi, who rejected the Johannine writings in the New Testament as forgeries of the heresiarch Cerinthus. However, both of these assertions are problematic and difficult to prove. The author of the refutation was embattled against two successive bishops of Rome, Zephrinus and Callistus. The author came very much from the Logos Christology camp, and thus his Christology had subordinationist tendencies. He saw the Christology espoused by Zephrinus as modalism. He argued that the bishop was a weak and unintelligent man, led to this doctrine by his deacon, Callistus, who was attempting to secure the Episcopal throne for himself. For it cast a long shadow over the theological debates of the Church. While the names of Noetus and Praxius were largely ignored, the name of Sibelius lived on. When Zephrinus died, though, and Callistus became bishop, Sibelius was excommunicated. Clearly, despite the contentions of the refutation author, Callistus was not a Sibelian. In fact, from the evidence we have, it appears the bishop wanted to avoid the pitfalls of both Platonic Logos Christology and modalism. Both he and Zephrinus started, like Irenaeus, with the person of Jesus Christ as found in Scripture and proclaimed in the Gospel, rather than starting with the eternal Logos of God the Father. Callistus tried to affirm the divinity of Jesus and his unity with the Father, but also his distinction from the Father. The problem was Callistus did not have a very clear way of articulating this, and the words ascribed to him in the refutation don't always help in demonstrating his theology did not have at least some modalist tendencies. For instance, his statement discussing the Incarnation, Quote, the one who is seen is a man, he is the Son, but the Spirit contained in the Son, he is the Father. Green, 110. It is easy to see how an unsympathetic critic could construe this as a combination of adoptionism and patripassionism, especially when all Callistus really did to clarify his views was to accuse the school of the refutation of being die-theist. On top of this, Callistus was also accused of supposedly being lax in his policies towards Christian life, such as giving recognition to upper-class women cohabiting with a slave or freedman, ordaining clergy who had been married multiple times, allowing clergy to marry, declaring no sin unforgivable, and even having repentant heretics re-baptized. All of these were perceived by the rigorous author of the refutation as falling away from the austere morality of the apostles. The author of the refutation felt his true battle was with Callistus. Despite the fact that Callistus excommunicated Sibelius and even explicitly rejected Patripassionism, the author of the refutation still viewed him as a heretic. He also undermined the bishop's character by relating a very unflattering account of Callistus' life before he became bishop. The author relates that Callistus was the slave of a Christian freedman who failed miserably in his job of handling his master's finances. After a failed suicide attempt, he was put to work in a bakery before being released to collect some of the debt. He tried to collect debts owed by some local Jews, but only succeeded in causing a riot by entering a synagogue on the Sabbath, demanding money. So Callistus found himself deported by the urban prefect to the harsh mines of the island of Sardinia. Callistus was thus not truly a Christian confessor for the faith, 
according to the refutation. And thus, his being released by Victor's intercession with Marcia was not justified. How much of this story is true is unclear, but it certainly shows just how little the school of Hippolytus thought of Callistus. Speaking of Hippolytus, it is finally time to bring him into this unfolding story. Hippolytus of Rome was the last Western church father to write in Greek. Some sources state he was a disciple of the great Irenaeus. While we cannot know this for sure, it does make sense as Hippolytus would develop a Christology that allowed the Logos camp and the followers of Callistus to reach common ground. However, the story of Hippolytus starts with schism, as he, inheriting his antipathy for Callistus from the author of the refutation, deemed the bishop of Rome heretical, and was then set up by his followers as the true orthodox bishop. Thus Hippolytus became the first so-called anti-pope. Okay, Technically, Natalius, the former adoptionist, was the first anti-pope. But since Hippolytus' episcopacy lasted longer and had way more importance, we'll let him have the title. He outlived both Callistus, who was actually martyred by pagans on October 14th, 222 AD, and Callistus' successor, Urbanus, who died on May 23rd, 230 AD. Urbanus was succeeded by Pontianus, who was consecrated Bishop of Rome July 21st. Pontianus was the Roman bishop who held the synod that concurred with Demetrius of Alexandria and condemned Origen. Returning to Hippolytus, in his work Contra Noetum, the anti-pope developed a Christology which bridged the gap between the opposing Roman factions. He unquestionably identified the Logos of God the Father with the incarnate Jesus Christ. The pre-incarnate Logos had been seen by the Old Testament prophets, whose writings foreshadowed what was to come in Jesus. The historical carpenter from Nazareth really was the eternal Logos of the Father made flesh. To distinguish between the prosopa, or persons, of the triados, or trinity, Hippolytus used the term economy. The persons of the Godhead were distinguished by their roles. The Father orders, the Son carries out these orders, and the Holy Spirit reveals this. God is one because the divine activity is one unified activity. But the way this activity is accomplished and carried out is revealed to be triadic in shape. Hippolytus is credited with many other works besides the Contra Noetum, which deal with biblical exegesis, history, apologetics, and perhaps most interestingly, the big villain of Christian eschatology, the Antichrist. Hippolytus devoted a treaty to the subject called On Christ and the Antichrist. We will examine Hippolytus' work here in a future episode on apocalyptic beliefs, once we've covered the 3rd century. All of this internal theological factionalism within the Roman Church was about to be given a hard shove into more earthly concerns. The reign of Alexander Severus had been a relatively good one for Christians, aside from isolated incidents like the martyrdom of Callistus. But in early 235, this all came to an end. On the Rhine frontier of the empire, a massive campaign was prepared against the Germans. But Alexander, as he had done before, decided to negotiate and bargain for peace rather than fight. His soldiers mutinied and assassinated both him and his mother, Julia Mamea. Alexander Severus may have been the first emperor to hold a positive attitude towards Christians. His mother had both conversed with Origen, and even Hippolytus himself had dedicated his book on the resurrection to her. With their deaths came the end of the house of Septimius Severus, and with it the last legs of stability for the classical Roman Empire. 
For the next fifty years, the empire would exist in a state of near-constant civil war, suffer foreign invasion, a plague, and even be split into three realms. The crisis of the third century began with Alexander's death. All this was bad news for Christians. If Rome was suffering calamity, it meant Jupiter and the gods were angry. And so, as we have seen time and again, Christians would be blamed, persecuted, and martyred. Although we are still over a decade away from the first imperial, empire-wide persecution, an imperial persecution of sorts did occur almost immediately after the murder of Alexander. The man the Rhine legions chose to elevate to the purple was one Gaius Julius Verus Maximinus, also called Maximinus Thrax or Maximinus the Thracian. He was a giant, barrel-chested man and a soldier through and through. Like the Nephilim of old or Goliath the Gittite, this giant warrior Maximinus took action against the people of God. Eusebius states Christians were prominent in Alexander's household. Maximinus saw to it they were eradicated with the rest of the household. He then, according to Eusebius, issued an edict against Christian leaders. The scope and extent of this edict is highly uncertain, and it may have been confined to just the city of Rome. We will explore potential provincial examples of Maximinus' persecution in the next episode. For the Church of Rome, however, both the sitting bishop Pontianus and the anti-pope Hippolytus were arrested and exiled to work in the mines of Sardinia. There they endured a long and slow death by means of harsh labor. Before their martyrdom, however, Pontianus and Hippolytus reconciled, with the latter subordinating his followers to the former, reuniting the Catholic community in Rome. Before they both died in the autumn of 235, Pontianus abdicated, and the leadership of the Roman Church passed to one Antares. With Hippolytus' death, Greek effectively ceased to be the main language in the Roman Church, with Latin taking its place. Antares himself did not live long, and died of natural causes on January 3rd that following year. His successor, Fabian, was consecrated only seven days later. Eusebius relates a story of how a dove perched itself on his head, and at the supposed sight of this, the Roman Christians took it as divine designation, and made him bishop. Fabian was to have a long episcopate, but he too would eventually suffer martyrdom. However, that story is for another day. Next episode, we will return to the life of Origen, now based in Caesarea, Palestine. In particular, his relationship with his most famous student, Gregory the Wonder Woman. Welcome to the History of the Early Church, Episode 26, Origin at Caesarea. In the last two episodes, we examined the contemporaries of Origin, both East and West. Today, we turn our attention back to Origin himself. We left Origen around 233-234 AD, when he had permanently left Alexandria and settled in Caesarea, Palestine. From here on out, the Roman capital of the Holy Land was to be his home. 
Origin, of course, would still travel across the Eastern Empire, except Egypt, but it was from Caesarea that he would be based. His friends, Bishop Alexander and Bishop Theoctistus, made him feel at home, allowing him to preach regularly as a presbyter in each of their respective cities. Shortly after his arrival, Ambrosius and the stenographers arrived, and Origen was back to doing what he loved, studying the Bible. Origen then began to, in addition to his travels and sermons, continue his major biblical works, including the Hexapla and the Commentary on the Gospel of John. Origen had already in Alexandria completed the first five of what would eventually be a 32-book-long commentary on John. He also composed commentaries on Genesis, the Song of Solomon, the Gospel of Matthew, and Paul's Epistle to the Romans, just to name a few. In fact, nearly every book of the Bible received a commentary, homily slash sermon, or some kind of exegetical treatment. One of the most interesting is Origen's sermon on 1 Samuel 28, the Witch of Endor story. In the story, the first king of Israel, Saul, asked a witch to summon the prophet Samuel from Hades, breaking the Torah's prohibition against necromancy. The witch indeed calls the holy prophet up, and he tells Saul that his life will soon be over. Yahweh has condemned him. David will be king. The passage raised many questions. Did Samuel really appear, or was it the demon? who was empowering the witch. If Samuel really had appeared, did that mean the demon was able to summon him? And if it really was Samuel, how could such a pro holy prophet be in Hades? Origen delivered a homily at Jerusalem addressing the passage. He affirmed that it really was Samuel who appeared, and not a demon. The text of scripture did not say the witch and king Saul saw a demon who appeared as Samuel, it said they saw Samuel. Samuel also prophesied the truth to Saul, whereas a demon could not. So, why was a holy prophet in Hades? Because, Origen argued, all the righteous people before Christ were in Hades, waiting for him to conquer death by death. Samuel, in fact, Origen asserts, was preparing people in Hades to receive the gospel in advance. Whether in Jerusalem or Caesarea or somewhere else, Origen was always devoting his mind to biblical scholarship on behalf of the church. For everyone, Origen preached as a presbyter. But for the more intellectually inclined, Origen had his school. Just as Justin Martyr and Pantanus had established Christian schools in Rome and Alexandria, respectively, Origen established his school in Caesarea. When he left Alexandria, Origen's advanced division of the Alexandrian Catechetical School went with him. But now, with the total support of his bishop, Origen's school was to be an establishment entirely of his design. It also included a great Christian library, which was to become quite famous and influential. Palestine now had two Christian libraries, Origins in Caesarea and Alexander's in Jerusalem. The curriculum of Origins Academy began with the teaching of virtue, followed by Greek philosophical logic and physics. These three areas were used as preparation for the study of the Bible. The goal of all this was not simply to teach and learn knowledge, but to actually have the students become spiritually transformed. In other words, to instruct Christians in the philosophical life. In imitation of Jesus himself, Origen both practiced what he preached and used the Socratic method to transform his students. Origen had thus turned the Church of Caesarea into a prime center of religious learning and life. Caesarea Maritima was a diverse cosmopolitan city, which included pagans, Jews, Christians, and even Samaritans. By the end of the century, these four groups would actually be about the same in terms of numbers. Origen's Jewish Christian friend, the Hebrew, had already exposed him to Jewish exegesis of the Old Testament. 
at Caesarea, Origen was able to engage and converse more readily with leading rabbis. There was already a Jewish school in Caesarea, founded by Rabbi Hoshea. Indeed, Rabbi Hoshea may have actually used Origen's text of the great Jewish Hellenist, Philo of Alexandria, for his own studies. Origen's attitude toward the rabbis was predictably ambivalent. On the one hand, Origen, like all Christian scholars of his time, strongly asserted that the church was God's true covenant people, and that all Jews needed to repent and believe Jesus was their Messiah. He saw the destruction of the temple, the defeat of Bar Kokhba, and the subsequent exiles as God's judgment for the Jewish rejection of the gospel and persecution of Jesus and the apostles. The Jews of Caesarea in return could often be extremely hostile and abusive towards Christians, just as their co-religionists were across the rest of the empire. The Old Testament was simply unintelligible for someone not familiar with Judaic traditions. Usually, the literal meaning had to be understood before an allegorical spiritual application could be made. The rabbis proved quite helpful to Origen in this regard. At Caesarea, Jewish rabbis and Christian theologians both fought and debated and assisted and influenced each other. Religious conversions are also attested to on both sides. The dueling children of Abraham had thus established vibrant competing academies for students to learn at. Among Origen's Caesarean students, two from Cappadocia became famous and revered bishops. Firmilian and Gregory Thaumaturges, or Gregory the Wonder Worker. Both of these men will play a prominent role in the church in the later 3rd century, so I want to take this opportunity to introduce them. Firmilian had become bishop of the Roman capital of Cappadocia, Caesarea Mazaka, or Caesarea Eusebia, in 232 AD. He encountered Origen during the latter's travels across the east, after his departure from Alexandria. Clearly taken in by the great scholar, Firmilian spent much time in Palestine listening to Origen's teaching. He also invited Origen on various occasions to come to Cappadocia to assist the local churches. In 236, however, the Cappadocian Christians were caught up in a wave of persecution. At the same time this persecution occurred, which we will get to in a moment, Origen's patron Ambrosius and his friend Protoctetus, a presbyter in Caesarea Maritima, were also suffering persecution in Palestine. Origen addressed to them a treatise entitled Exhortation to Martyrdom. Because the emperor Maximinus Thrax appears to have issued an anti-Christian edict in Rome the previous year, which, as we saw last episode, resulted in the martyrdoms of Hippolytus and Pontianus, many historians have joined all three episodes of persecution together, claiming Maximinus instituted the first empire-wide persecution of the church. But these instances were most likely all independent events, and the notion that Maximinus launched a persecution on such a scale seems dubious. Firmilian's account of the persecution of his community is clearly local in nature, an origin does not give enough information on the scope of the persecution in Palestine. No other early sources aside from Eusebius claim Maximinus as a persecutor. Eusebius does not provide any examples of martyrs from this time. He was likely operating, again, from his assumption that persecution was always an imperial affair. Hence, the persecutions of 235 to 236 were only united in anti-Christian sentiment, not imperial action. Although we do not know the precise details of their ordeals, other than it lasted for three years, Ambrosius and Protoctetus survived. Detailed information on the persecution in Cappadocia, however, is available from a letter of Vermilion. In 236, a horrific earthquake struck Cappadocia and Pontus, destroying cities, towns, villages, and countless lives. Firmilian even says whole towns were swallowed up by the earth. Clearly, something was wrong. Divine wrath had struck. 
So the governor, Licinius Serenianus, began a bitter persecution of the obvious scapegoat, the Christians. Many Christians fled to neighboring provinces. In the midst of their absence, there sprung up a self-proclaimed Christian prophetess. Like the Montanus heretics before her, the woman behaved in a state of ecstasy and claimed to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. When she spoke, it was not the her speaking, but the Spirit speaking through her. She claimed the power to shake the earth, repeatedly announced her plans to go to Jerusalem, and would also walk barefoot in the frozen snow, not once showing any sign of pain. Many were amazed and left the church to follow her. She baptized and performed her own Eucharistic sacrifice. She even managed to entice a presbyter and deacon to join her and even lay with her. At this point, an exorcist from the Orthodox faithful arose, revealed her deeds, and proceeded to overcome the demon which had possessed her. Vermillion describes this story for reasons which will become apparent in the next decade, when the church will be in controversy over the validity of sacraments performed by heretics. We will meet Vermillion again in future episodes. The other famous disciple of Origen was Gregory the Wonderworker. Gregory was also from Cappadocia. He came from Neo Caesarea in the region of Pontus, not far north of Caesarea Mazaka. Born into an aristocratic pagan family, Gregory began his life with the name Theodore. At the age of 14, his father died, and Gregory, his sister, and his brother, Athenodorus, were left to the sole care of their mother. Gregory would look back on this moment as the beginning of his contact with the true, saving Logos. His father was a devotee of the pagan gods, so his death freed his son to pursue another faith. So Gregory began to involve himself in some kind of local Christian community, although its precise nature cannot be determined. During this time, he was being schooled with a standard Greek education, rhetoric, as well as Latin. His Latin tutor recommended Gregory study Roman law. Though ambivalent about the idea, Gregory decided to seriously pursue it by going either to Rome itself or Beirutus, modern-day Beirut, the capital of Roman Phoenicia. Gregory decided on the closer city when his sister asked him to escort her to her husband in Palestine. Her husband was an advisor to the governor, so she needed to be escorted to the provincial capital, Caesarea Maritima. Traveling by the Imperial Post, Gregory was brought to the city Origen resided in. His arrival is usually dated to 237 or 238. Origen spent much time trying to convince Gregory to stay and learn Christian philosophy. Finally, Gregory gave in, joined the school, and began to devote himself to an intellectual and philosophic Christianity. Although he appears to have continued studying Roman law and Latin, his major preoccupation became being a student of Origen. Under Origen, he passed through the great scholar's curriculum, learning about Plato, Aristotle, Stoicism, but most importantly of all, Holy Scripture. All philosophies had to be understood in the critical light of Christian tradition. Gregory spent about seven years as a student of Origen. When Familia Duty finally called him to depart Caesarea for home in 242, Gregory addressed a speech of thanksgiving to Origen, presenting the great scholar as a godly and saintly man who revealed to him the true depth and light of the Logos, Jesus Christ, and led him out of darkness. He looked back on his life from the perspective of divine providence, believing God had guided him to Caesarea. Origen had given Gregory the greatest gift of all, inflamed love for the divine Logos. After returning home to Neo-Caesarea, Gregory was eventually made bishop at the insistence of Fiadimus, bishop of nearby Amisa. His brother, Athenodorus, was also made a bishop in Pontus. Gregory's episcopacy would prove to be a long and eventful one. He laid the foundation for the Church of Cappadocia and Pontus, which was to become highly influential in the following centuries. Gregory's missionary work among the pagans became the stuff of legend, with numerous stories of varying historicity, 
being passed down about the great bishop. His many miracles earned him the epithet Thaumaturgus, or Wonder Worker. So successful was his evangelism and discipleship that supposedly when he died, the number of pagans left in the region was the same as the number of Christians there were when Gregory became bishop. We shall meet Gregory again in future episodes, as he will play a key role in some of the major events and controversies of the church in the 3rd century. Next episode, we will finish our discussion of the life of Origen and examine more closely his influential but controversial legacy. Welcome to the History of the Early Church, Episode 27, Origin, The Later Years. Having established a Christian academy, tutored the two most prominent Cappadocian bishops, pushed biblical scholarship to a new zenith, and now about to enter his 60s, one might think that Origen would start to retire from public life and begin preparing to repose in the Lord. But Origen, as we have seen, was not like most men, and the 240s AD would prove to be as eventful as the earlier decades of his already eventful life. In these ten odd years or so, Origen would continue in his role as presbyter and professor, as well as combating heretics, intervening in church councils, writing to the Roman Emperor and Empress, and authoring one of the most important apologetic works in the early church. Despite his well-deserved reputation as a great intellectual and debater, other Orthodox thinkers did not always agree with Origen. A notable example was the Christian polymath Julius Africanus. He and Origen engaged in a friendly exchange over the authenticity of the story of Susanna, a portion of the book of Daniel found in the Greek Septuagint, but not in the Hebrew Aramaic text. For those of you not familiar with the story of Susanna, I will quickly summarize. The story is set in the 6th century BC, during the Babylonian exile of the Jews. Two Jewish elders, appointed as judges for the Jewish community in Babylon, plot to seduce a noble Jewish woman named Susanna. After finding her bathing in a garden, the judges accost her as she prepares to leave, claiming they will have her arrested and condemned to death for having an affair with a boy in the garden, a crime they will both testify to as witnesses. The only way she can be spared is if she sleeps with the two of them. Susanna refuses to be blackmailed, but has no further recourse. But then the prophet Daniel arrives, and, receiving direct divine inspiration, intervenes on her behalf. He cross-examines the two judges separately, asking which tree in the garden Susanna had been under when she supposedly had the affair. Their answers are different, and as a result, Susanna is cleared of all charges. The two elders are executed, and Daniel gains recognition from the Jewish people. Africanus pointed out how the story was a later edition and not part of the original book. His arguments to support this, which modern biblical scholars have validated, were as follows. In the rest of the book, Daniel always prophesies from visions and dreams, never direct inspiration. The alliteration in the Greek text for the names of the trees in the garden would not work in Hebrew, only in Greek. The story quotes from other Israelite prophets. Finally, 
Overall, Susanna is clearly of a different style. Origen responded, not quite so successfully, with a longer letter. He disputed that the style was different, and that the puns and alliteration could not work in Hebrew, based off his own interactions with Jews. Further concerning Jews, Theodosian had included Susanna in his Greek translation of Daniel. But nevertheless, yes, Origen conceded, Susanna was not in the Jewish version of the Old Testament. But after all, neither were the chapters about Bel and the dragon and the hymn of the three ewes. The reason the Jews omitted Susanna, Origen suspected, was because the story portrayed Jewish leaders in a negative light, so the rabbis only handed the story down orally. At the heart of the matter was Origen's main reason for accepting the story as canonical. Susanna was part of the traditional Septuagint Greek text used by the church, and it was not the place of Christians to remove from the Bible what had been handed down to them. Though devoted to biblical scholarship, Origen was also a man of the church. Origen was to find himself in another, far less cordial dispute with his fellow Catholics. I discussed in episode 23 that one of the points of controversy concerning Origen's theology was the allegation that he claimed the devil could or would be saved. This charge resulted from an exchange Origen had had with an Alexandrian Christian at Ephesus while he was traveling across the east in the 240s. The Alexandrian completely misrepresented the great scholar by composing a largely fictitious transcript of their debate. What Origen had actually taught was that Satan was damned because of his free choice to oppose God, not that he was predestined to Gehenna on account of his nature. But the unsympathetic bishop of Alexandria, Heraclos, was ready to accept another accusation of heresy against his former teacher. When the Alexandrian informed his bishop, the Egyptian primate wrote to Fabianus, the bishop of Rome, in an attempt to have Origen firmly condemned. After all, Pontianus had supported Demetrius back in the 230s, so it stood to reason Rome would side with Alexandria again. Heraclos also attempted to depose a certain Ammonius, bishop of Thumus in the Nile Delta. Ammonius had harbored Origen during his flight from Egypt when Demetrius condemned him. On the pretext of harboring a false teacher, Heraclos tried, unsuccessfully, to depose Ammonius. Origen, for his part, knew that he needed to gain wider support for his position. He wrote letters defending himself in his, to his few remaining friends in Alexandria, his patron, Ambrosius, and his friend, Fermilion, in Cappadocia, along with other leading clergy. He also wrote directly to Fabianus. The case against him concerned not only the salvation of the devil, but also his foundational book on first principles, which most clearly articulated his highly controversial doctrine of the pre-existence of souls. Origen asserted that the book was a private work, never intended for publication. Some later sources claim that it was Ambrosius who Origen accused of publishing on first principles, and as a result, Ambrosius fell out with Origen and left nothing to his client in his will. I am personally skeptical of this because it is omitted in Eusebius and comes from later sources, and also because the evidence suggests Ambrosius was still supporting Origen in 248 when he commissioned him to write the Contra Celsum. More on that later. In the end, the controversy blew over because in 247, Heraclas died and was succeeded by Dionysius, head of the catechetical school and another student of origin. Dionysius did not wish to continue the conflict, and the entire matter was dropped. Although Origen never returned to Alexandria, Dionysius was not actively hostile to him like his predecessors had been. While his relations with the churches of Rome and Alexandria were cold, Origen continued to hold good standing in Anatolia and the Levant. 
In his debates against heretics, Origen was invited by local bishops to church councils in Roman Arabia, no less than three times. In all three cases, he managed to convince the accused heretics to change their minds and embrace orthodoxy. Which is a pretty remarkable feat, when you think about it. These councils and change of minds not only testified to the general esteem Origen was held in across the East, but even the esteemed bishops held him in. In one case, we actually have a transcript of the proceedings which clearly show the deferential attitude the Arabian bishops paid to Origen. The first of these three councils concerned one Beriulus, the bishop of Bostra, modern-day Basra in Jordan, the Roman capital of Arabia. Beriulus held to a sort of adoptionist Christology, where Jesus did not pre-exist his earthly state, and his divinity was merely an indwelling of God the Father, like a prophet or holy man. Origen managed to expose this error, and Beriulus returned to the Orthodox fold. The second Arabian synod he attended dealt with a group of Christians who believed that the soul was mortal and decayed and died like the body. Again, Origen was able to convince these people to change their minds and believe the Orthodox teaching that the soul did not die with the body and continued to exist after death. The third and final Arabian synod Origen attended, and the one we have the aforementioned transcript of, concerned a certain Heraclides. Because the beginning of the dialogue is lost, it is not entirely clear what heresy Heraclides held to, but it appears to have had similarities to that of Baron Eulis in that it was a monarchianism of sorts. However, Heraclides appears to have favored the modalist monarchianism, or Sibelianism, as it was being known, which clashed most decisively with Origen's own Trinitarian theology, which emphasized the distinction between the Father and the Son. After bringing Heraclides over to his side, the floor was open for questions, and the bishops began to ask Origen his thoughts on various topics. The last heresy Origen dealt with in Roman Arabia was the sect of the Alchesiites, followers of Elksai, an obscure Judaizing sect which arose during the reign of Trajan. The exact nature of its beliefs are unknown, but it appears to have enforced some degree of Torah observance and a belief in the femininity of the Holy Spirit, among other things. Although mentioned by a few other early church writers, the Alchesiites would probably have been left to the dustbin of history had Eusebius not stated that the great scholar combated them. The province of Arabia had proved an eventful one for Origen. Not only was he busy there as a corrector of heresy, but it was also the place where he was first approached positively by the Roman state. During his earlier years, the governor had asked Origen to be sent to him to discuss religion. Origen's final positive encounter with the Roman state also had a connection to Arabia. The last emperor we discussed was Maximinus Thrax. He died in the Civil War of 238, known as the Year of the Six Emperors. Emerging from this conflict was the boy emperor Gordian III, who reigned until his mysterious death in 244. Succeeding Gordian was his Praetorian prefect, Marcus Julius Philippus, or Philip the Arab. Philip originated from the Romano-Arab village of Shaba, southeast of Damascus. He would reign for a mere five and a half years before, like so many other 3rd century emperors, dying in a civil war against a rival claimant to the throne. Philip's reign is known to students of Roman history for his celebration of the 1,000th birthday of the city of Rome. But for students of church history, his reign is most notable for two reasons. The fact that Origen wrote letters addressed to both Philip himself and his wife, and because of the speculation that Philip was actually a Christian. To take the former first, Eusebius states that Origen addressed letters to both the emperor and the empress. 
Unfortunately, no context is given in Eusebius as to why Origen wrote these letters. Whether or not the imperial couple ever received them or interacted with Origen is unknown. However, given Origen's previous contacts with the imperial government, it would not be surprising if the emperor or his wife initiated the contact or were receptive of Origen's letters. This leads to the other area of contact between Philip and the church. Was he actually, 70 years before Constantine, the first Christian Roman emperor? The story as reported by Eusebius has Philip, after his ascension, attempting to gain admittance into a church during the last night of the Easter Vigil. The local bishop, however, refused him admittance until he made an open confession and joined those in the assembly who were doing penance, on account of the various charges being brought against Philip, probably the accusation that he had murdered his predecessor Gordian to become emperor. Philip agreed and was allowed it. Eusebius relates the story in a cautious way, suggesting he was hesitant about its veracity. The only other evidence that could possibly corroborate this account is a later tradition, which places the event in Antioch, and names the bishop as Babylas, whose tenure is dated to 237 to 251. If this account is an independent tradition, and not simply a later embellishment of Eusebius, then it adds some plausibility to the story. Philip became emperor probably in February of 244, near the Roman border with Persia. Hence, a stop at Antioch in the spring of that year, when Easter would have been taking place, fits the known chronology. But at best, he was sympathetic to the church. There's no evidence he was baptized, made Christianity a legal religion, or gave up his pagan duties as emperor, the prime example being the ceremonies, sacrifices, and games celebrating the 1,000th birthday of Rome. In spite of Philip's millennial games, though, the Roman Empire was still in dire straits. Near-constant civil war had not abated, the economy was declining as Roman coinage was being devalued to the point of worthlessness. On the borders of the empire, the Persian king Shapur was still on the aggressive, and a new group of Germanic barbarians had begun to raid in the Balkans, the Goths. The Goths, a Germanic tribal confederation from the modern Ukraine, will come to play a long and important role in both the history of Rome and the history of the early church. Origen was not a, unaware of this crisis, and he understood how easily persecution could descend upon the church as a result. For his part, the great scholar was ready to die for his lord, but his congregation was not. Origen lamented how many lay people had become more concerned with earthly matters than salvation. Since the church had entered into the societal mainstream during the Severan Age, it had been growing lax with its newfound toleration. Origen would have none of it. He was the son of a martyr. He had seen his students in Alexandria martyred, and had seen his friends Vermilion and Ambrosius endure persecution. Despite his efforts, though, when the first empire-wide persecution did come, the church was largely unprepared and the result was a disaster for Christianity. But that is for another day. This haunting atmosphere was not lost on Origen's patron. Ambrosius asked Origen to write a refutation of the book On True Doctrine by the pagan philosopher Celsus. We discussed Celsus and his critique of Christianity back in episode 17. Now, 70 years later, a Christian intellectual set himself to the task of refuting the pagan attack. And not just any intellectual, but the great scholar himself. Next episode, we will discuss the Contra Celsum, or Against Celsus, and then conclude our account of origin with an examination of his theological legacy. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or feedback about the podcast, 
you can email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com. Please don't forget to leave a review on iTunes, post a comment on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash early church podcast, and don't forget to visit the website at historyoftheearlychurch.wordpress.com. Hello, and welcome to the History of the Early Church, Episode 28, Origins Legacy. Origins' book, Contra Celsum, is probably his most famous work after On First Principles and the Hexapla. In it, we can see how a mind like Origen would respond to the arguments of an educated pagan, since Contra Celsum is quite long, what follows will merely be a sample of Origen's defense of the Christian Church. The major criticisms of Celsus we discussed in episode 17 fell into four categories. Christianity's relationship to Roman society, the novelty and unoriginality of Christianity, the character of Jesus and his apostles, and specific Christian doctrines and practices. In defending the faith, Origen drew upon arguments from earlier Christian authors, Greek philosophical schools like the Stoics, and his own thought. It was common for educated pagans like Celsus to assert that all the deities of various nations were under the umbrella of the one supreme god. By worshipping their local deities, each people gave worship indirectly to the supreme god. Because of the uncertainties in religion and philosophy, with all their competing claims, the most mature and reasonable path to follow was one's ancestral traditions. These could be mixed with other traditions and philosophies, but they should never be abandoned. This was, in essence, the heart of pagan conservatism, what Celsus called the true doctrine. There are so many religions and belief systems, no one path can claim exclusivity to the whole truth. Hence, everyone should continue the customs passed down to them, and in this way, everyone acknowledges the highest God. Christianity rejected all this. There was a supreme God, yes, but all other belief systems were, at best, incomplete, and at worst, downright false. Christian truth meant turning away from those ancestral traditions, something highly antisocial and threatening to Greco-Roman society. Origen defended the Christian position by pointing out not all of the ancestral traditions hallowed by Celsus were good. Barbarians who perform human sacrifice, for instance. He also asserted that the worship of demons was always evil. In the classical world, demons, or diamones, was a generic term for spiritual beings, but in Christian thought it meant only wicked spirits. Yes, there were lesser spiritual beings serving the high god, but these were his angels, who always directed humans to worship God and not themselves. The demons, on the other hand, enslaved their followers to their names and rituals. Worshipping idols was clearly a folly, inanimate objects made by men ensnared by demons. How could an educated philosopher like Celsus not see that? This was, for Origen, a major failing of pagan philosophy. It acknowledged, on some level, the silliness of worshipping idols, but had no real way of turning people away from it. Though Celsus ridiculed the worship of Christians, Origen countered, saying Christian worship was the only truly 
spiritual worship, with no need for idols or temples, simply the mind of the believer toward the high God. Indeed, Christianity had brought more people into directly worshipping the high God than philosophy ever did or could. Philosophy was for elite men. Christianity was for everyone. Male, female, rich, poor, young, old, barbarian, and Roman. This leads to another area of Celsus's criticism of Christianity. Despite its claims to be an intellectually respectable religion, Christianity actively encouraged the proselytization of non-elites. Celsus portrayed Christian evangelism as a kind of empty promise-making, preying on women and children and promising them eternal life if they rejected the ancestral traditions of their fathers. Origen gave no defense against this. Rather, he embraced it. Christianity had brought the ideals so beloved in Greek philosophy to all peoples. In other words, Christians were better at teaching philosophy than philosophers. The church, by actively reaching out to women and non-elites, was able to do something Celsus and his ilk could never do, transform the lives of ordinary people with the virtues of philosophy. Nevertheless, Origen could not completely deflect the charge that many lay Christians were simple-minded, abandoned reason, often accepted doctrine on blind faith, and believed in an angry sky god who bore little resemblance to the rational deity of Plato. But for Origen, these people did not represent true Christianity. One of Origen's most common criticisms of Celsus was that he did not understand what true Christianity was. And when I say true Christianity, I mean Origen's version of Christianity. In many ways, Origen acknowledged that Celsus's portrayal of Christians was accurate but that was because such people were the simple lay folk. Yes, they may have been the majority in the church, but had Celsus truly desired to understand Christianity, he should have consulted someone educated and versed in philosophy. Someone like Origen. Origen's deflection of criticism in this way almost looks as though he fell into the no true Scotsman fallacy. But on the other hand, I think we can agree that if one wishes to critique a belief system, one should seek out the best and brightest of its adherents. However, the picture Origen paints of himself as the representative of educated Christians could hardly be complete. Origen's unique ideas, such as the pre-existence of souls or allegorical exegesis, were not shared by all his peers. There were many other highly intelligent Christians in the empire who disagreed with Origen's positions. Celsus is charged that Christians were dangerous because of their refusal to serve the emperor in military and government was answered by Origen in a way that would not have changed Celsus's mind. Origen believed Christians should not participate in either the Roman government or military. But, he claimed, the prayers of Christians to God offered the emperor more protection and service than did his legions. And if all the world, both Roman and barbarian, became Christian, there would be no need to fight because the world would be at peace. It's easy to see why Celsus would not have found this answer convincing. Beyond military and government service, Christians appeared to completely reject participation in public life. Much of this was due to the fact that pagan sacrifice, idolatry, was integrated into almost every aspect of public life, something which amounted to apostasy for Christians. For Celsus, though, the church was like a society within society, secret and subversive. Like Tertullian and the Apologists, Origen consistently asserted that Christians were the most moral, law-abiding citizens of the empire. The church was, in a way, its own society, but its relationship to the Roman Empire was mutually beneficial, not parasitic. Celsus had asserted Jesus was not a miracle worker, but a charlatan of low birth, a sorcerer who used magic to deceive people. 
Origen easily countered this by pointing out how Jesus' miracles called people to virtue and goodness. Sorcerers never did that. They only performed tricks for personal gain. Jesus also acted in a humble and meek manner, not a theatrical self-promoter. Finally, had Jesus been a fraud, he would not have been willing to die on the cross. And the same goes for his disciples. Had they not truly believed that they had seen their master risen from the dead, they would not have been willing to be martyred. In addition, Jesus' low birth, and that of many of his disciples, only added to their credibility, not the other way around. For how could someone of humble origins teach such wisdom and inspire so much good if they were not truly inspired by God? Celsus had also attacked the historical reliability of the gospel accounts, claiming they were based on hearsay. For instance, Jesus' resurrection was dismissed as an invention based off older invented stories, where a hero simply disappeared and then reappeared, claiming they had been to Hades and returned alive again. Origen countered this by noting how Jesus' death was a public execution carried out in front of thousands of Judeans. Had his death occurred in secret, then the story of his resurrection could have easily been fabricated. But Jesus clearly died and was buried. His death was beyond dispute. He could not have hidden underground in a secret cave and then reappeared. The recentness of Christianity, the fact that the church was only about two centuries old, made it less credible in the eyes of men like Celsus. He could appreciate religions which had great antiquity, the ancestral traditions of nations. Even Judaism, for all Celsus's criticism of it, was an established ancient religion. Christianity was a new sect claiming to be a continuation of Judaism, but in fact, Christians did not follow the Jewish law or live in a Jewish manner. They did not even honor the ancestral traditions of their parent religion. Hence, any assertion of antiquity by Christians by way of the Old Testament was rejected by Celsus. In doing so, he touched a key area, Christianity's relationship to Judaism. If such a link could be shown to be false, Celsus was correct in demonstrating the church was a new cult, not an ancient faith. Origen responded by pointing out the interconnectedness of the Old and New Testaments, how Jewish followers of Jesus, including Peter and Paul, still followed the literal Mosaic law, and that Gentile believers also followed the law in a spiritual and allegorical way in light of the Messiah. The spiritual meaning of the Torah was its true meaning, and only Christians with the revelation of Jesus and the Holy Spirit were able to understand this true meaning. Celsus rejected Christian use of allegory to interpret the Old Testament, but Origen pointed out how if it was acceptable to use allegory to get philosophy out of Homer and the myths, it was just as acceptable for the Bible, if not more so. Celsus had no consistent reason to reject this. Therefore, adding this all up, Christianity was not a novelty, but a most ancient faith and the rightful continuation of the religion of ancient Israel. Celsus strongly criticized the Christian doctrine of Satan, or the devil, finding the whole idea quite stupid. The notion that God, or the Son of God, was opposed by a lesser evil spirit was an insult to the dignity of God. The high God could not be opposed by anyone. The idea that the Son of God would allow himself to be killed by the devil was also viewed as dumb by Celsus. What could be more offensive to divinity than that? Celsus admitted that Homer and the other ancient Greek authors spoke of a divine war and an evil serpent in the primordial past, but Christians misunderstood the combat myth with their Satan doctrine. Origen responded in a twofold way. First, Christians inherited the doctrine of Satan from Moses and the prophets of the Old Testament. Furthermore, the Old Testament was far older than even Homer, 
even pagan thinkers admitted to the great antiquity of the Jewish scriptures. Hence, Christians could not have misunderstood the Greek version of the combat myth, since their stories predate the Greek ones. Second, Satan, by opposing God, was actually doing something God desired. That is, testing humans to make them choose between right and wrong so they could be purified and fit for the heavenly presence. The devil may think he is defying God, but he is actually an unwitting pawn, unknowingly acting as an instrument in the purification of souls. Celsus also attacked the Judeo-Christian doctrine of resurrection. The doctrine of the resurrection had been a bone of contention between pagans and the church, going back to Paul's visit to the Areopagus in Athens. The material world was utterly inferior in Greek thought, and not worthy to be part of the afterlife, especially the body, which was such a weak and gross entity when compared to the soul. Gnostic Christianity had essentially been born upon caving in to these philosophical demands, and rejected matter as a foul creation of the evil Demiurge. But the church could not do such a thing. The resurrection was a central teaching of the apostolic tradition. It was the capstone on salvation and the Christian life. Truly, the doctrine was an area where Christianity and paganism would always be at odds. Being as imbued with Greek philosophy as he was, Origen could not help but see Celsus's point about the apparent crudeness of the resurrection. But Origen could also not bring himself to completely abandon the teaching of the church, no matter how much it embarrassed him. Thus, Origen tried to reach a middle ground, and in so doing, sowed the seeds for much later controversy. He emphasized the spiritual aspect of the resurrection over the physical, so much so that it often looks as though he denied its physicality altogether. I do not think he actually did so, but it's easy to see where his critics were coming from. Last but not least, we come to the heart of the debate over God between Celsus and Origen, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Celsus found it utterly abhorrent that God would demean himself and become human and that the Logos was born from a mortal woman, especially in such recent time. He also rejected Christian monotheism, saying the worship of Jesus detracted from the worship of the high God. In response, Origen declared that only by becoming human could the Logos perfectly reveal the Father to humanity. Humans were so tied to the flesh that only the incarnation of God could bring about true revelation and salvation. The Logos has always existed with the Father, but united himself to flesh from the Virgin Mary. Jesus' birth came at the perfect time, as Augustus Caesar had brought all the nations of the earth under Roman rule, making way for the spread of the gospel. Christians were monotheists. Because of the two divine hypostases, God was honored through the worship of his Logos, and the two were inseparable. When it came down to it, Celsus believed the Incarnation was unworthy of God, and Origen did not. Such disagreement was ultimately unresolvable. If Contra Celsum demonstrated anything, it showed that there were real, irreconcilable differences between the Church and Paganism. Teachings such as the Incarnation, the Resurrection, exclusive monotheism, creation out of nothing, and the Christian concern for the poor were unacceptable to educated pagan philosophers. Despite all the bridges that could be made on the back of Plato, Greek and biblical thought would never fully see eye to eye. This has been a mere sampling of Origen's arguments against Celsus. If you want more, I have placed links on the blog site to where you can access full translations of the Contra Celsum. Now we near the end of our discussion of Origen. We have devoted more time to him than any other Christian figure since the Apostle Paul. The reason for this is twofold. First is the historical record. 
Because of Eusebius and others, we have much more information about Origen than most anti-Nicene Christians. Second is the importance of Origen's legacy, which is what I want to focus on now. The great scholar's legacy is influential, multifaceted, and controversial. We will come back to Origen again and again and see how both his admirers and critics interpreted his ideas. Controversy over Origen centers around four major areas. The pre-existence of souls, the universe of salvation, the resurrection, and the trinity, specifically the relationship between the father and son. We discussed Origen's doctrine of the pre-existence of souls before, but I'll quickly recap. Origen taught that all human souls and angelic souls, or in Greek, nous, referring to the spiritual reality of the mind, pre-existed creation. Then the fall into sin occurred, and as a result, man fell into materiality, acquiring physical bodies and living on earth. As you can imagine, this was the most controversial teaching of origins. It diverged radically from the Genesis account, requiring extreme use of allegory to justify exegetically. It also implied that the body, the earth, and even marriage were not part of God's original good creation, but results of the fall and thus somehow wrong or sinful. Origen had, it seemed, capitulated to Gnosticism by essentially agreeing that the material world was highly inferior at best. This doctrine also informed Origen's Christology. Where did the human soul of Christ come from? Jesus was God, but also man, so he had a soul. Origen believed Christ's soul was pre-existent, but did not fall. This, too, would eventually be declared heretical. The next controversial originist doctrine was apocatastasis, or universal salvation. Origen did not believe Satan would be saved because the devil chose to reject God, not that he was damned by his nature. This much is certain. But did Origen also teach all humans and even demons would be saved? Well, maybe. His doctrine of the pre-existence of souls lended itself towards a total restoration. Just as all souls existed with God in harmony in the beginning, so they would all return at the end. As far as demons were concerned, Origen seems to have approved the notion that they too were doomed like Satan on account of their free will. But there is evidence that Origen believed that in the end, even after death, God would win over all humans. How exactly this worked out, and still did not compromise man's free will, is not clear. As we noted earlier, Origen was somewhat embarrassed by the biblical doctrine of resurrection, and went to great spiritualizing lengths when harmonizing it with Greek thought. But for all that, did the great scholar actually deny a physical body in the eschaton? Probably not. He did believe that some kind of change in the body occurred that made it different and spiritual. Hence, his doctrine appears to be in line with orthodox belief. It was later admirers of his that read his spiritualizing language in isolation and took it too far. Last but not least, we come to Origen's Trinitarianism. Specifically, did he teach that the Son was an ontologically subordinate, lesser being to the Father? It would not be until the 4th century when the Church will define exactly how it describes the Son's relationship to the Father. So, in regards to Origen's Trinitarian theology, he needs to be judged within the context of the 3rd century Church. Origen held that Christ was eternally born or begotten of the Father, eternal generation, which was to eventually prove a cornerstone of orthodoxy. This idea was not unique to him, but he was the first post-apostolic writer to give it focus. But his Platonism also led to a sharp distinction between the Father and Son. 
taken too far, and Jesus became a lesser being, separate from the Father. The various tensions within Catholic Trinitarianism did not start with Origen. As the century continues, we will see a major clash of two heresies, tritheism and modalism, which will force many church fathers to think even more about how to simultaneously express the distinction of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Logos as eternal generation, and the unity of God as one deity. For Origen, the Son was eternally derived from the Father, and so was Second, echoing Justin Martyr. Was this subordinationism? I think a charitable reading of Origen, with historical perspective, can allow him to be orthodox on this point. Perhaps most telling is that when Origen and Originism were condemned in the 6th century, it was not for subordinationism. Origen was a great biblical scholar. His condemnation and subsequent destruction of his works has earned him much sympathy from modern scholars, many of whom seem inclined towards the everyone condemned as a heretic was done so unfairly school of thought. Thus, many modern scholars have made great attempts to completely rehabilitate Origen and refute his ancient enemies. Other modern theologians have done the opposite, finding Origen's errors egregious in their effect on the early church, especially allegory, which they view as a wrong way to read the Bible, in contrast with historical grammatical exegesis. I am personally not swayed by either side. On account of the resurrection and the trinity, I think Origen is wrongfully accused of heresy. On account of the pre-existence of souls and universal salvation, though, I think his critics have a fair point. Despite all the controversy, Origen influenced the early church in many other ways. His biblical scholarship and use of allegory became standard in Christian interpretation, even if many reacted against it. Perhaps most of all, his devotion to the spiritual and ascetic life centered on prayer set a powerful example of how a Christian could live the philosophic life. His writings on prayer would become some of his most admired works for later generations of believers. Origen was an utterly unique individual in the early church. If I were to compose a list of the top five most influential early Christians, he would be on that list. His biblical scholarship, philosophy, and theology became widespread influences on Christianity across the ancient world, for good or for ill, far more than he could ever imagine. Whatever else may be said of him, Origen was a man of the church and sincerely strove with every fiber of his being to teach other believers how to grow ever closer to God. With that, we shall leave Origen. His death will be discussed briefly in a near episode, but our account of his story ends here. In a few short years, both Origen and many other Christian leaders will die in the first empire-wide persecution of the church, leaving the leadership of Christianity to a new group of men. Next episode, we will fully introduce the two bishops who will stand as the principal leaders of the church for the next dark and troublesome decade. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or feedback about the podcast, you can email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com. Please don't forget to leave a review on iTunes, post a comment on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash earlychurchpodcast, and don't forget to visit the website at historyoftheearlychurch.wordpress.com.